Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Friday afternoon, August 18th. This is going to be a long video in two parts because we have Hurricane Hillary to discuss in the Eastern Pacific, which will be moving up towards Southern California this weekend, but we also have storms developing in the Atlantic, and we'll need to talk about those, some of which could impact the Gulf of Mexico and the Eastern Caribbean. So stay tuned for the latter half of the video for information on that. We're gonna start though with Hurricane Hillary, and we don't normally talk about hurricanes in the Eastern Pacific, on this channel, uh, but this is going to impact directly northern Mexico and portions of the southwestern United States, including direct impacts to Southern California, a rather uncommon occurrence, and a possible U.S. landfall on the Pacific side, which is pretty rare. This is the GFS model showing the upper level steering pattern. This is North America here, the large view. So here's the southwestern United States. Here's Hurricane Hillary down at the bottom of your screen. And the steering feature here is this upper level low off of California, which is dipping down uh, just enough at the exact right time to kind of tug on Hillary and bring it all the way north. So you'll see it sit here off of California, ushering Hillary up. And uh, this big ridge over the central United States is causing southerly flow. This upper level low off of California is acting in concert with that to really usher all this moisture and the hurricane itself northward into California and the rest of the southwestern U.S. This has happened before, but it is usually multiple decades between events like this, certainly pretty uncommon. This is the latest data from the first recon aircraft to investigate Hillary directly. Coming in as I'm recording here, found a pass through the eye with a central pressure of 948 millibars, maximum winds in the northeastern quadrant of about 110 to 115 miles per hour. There has been some recent decay of the hurricane in just the last few hours. Thunderstorm activity has weakened in the eye wall somewhat, so it might be a little weaker than NHC's current estimate. And that's probably due to some cold oceanic upwelling. If we look at NOAA's hurricane model, this is where Hillary is now. And you can see that in the coloring, we have sea surface temperature and there's a cold patch near the east side of the storm. This is because Hillary is moving fairly slowly at the moment. It's turning slightly to the right and the water in the Eastern Pacific is typically rather shallow. So these factors combined mean that Hillary will be cooling this water quickly as it moves over it, and that could limit its maximum intensity somewhat. However, whether it's a Category 3, 4, or 5 hurricane south of Mexico won't really matter too much by the time it gets to the southwestern U.S. Uh, the stronger Hillary is now, the more impacts could be felt by the Baja Peninsula of Mexico, but once it gets up here, we're going to see a significantly weaker storm under hurricane intensity, and that's because if we go forward in the model here, you'll see Hillary move over progressively colder and colder water. One of the nice features for the United States specifically is that the Eastern Pacific perpetually has cold water being transported out of the mid-latitudes southward along the western U.S., and so you always have very cold water here, which is not warm enough to maintain hurricanes. And so we will see significant and quick weakening of Hillary on its way up the coast of the Baja Peninsula. We could still see hurricane conditions, that is winds at 75 miles per hour or stronger, along the Baja Peninsula as Hillary weakens. However, by the time it gets up here towards San Diego, Los Angeles, it will be under hurricane intensity. So we won't be talking about winds over 75, but there will still be strong winds and tropical storm watches are out for Southern California. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Now, while Hillary will be losing a lot of its wind power as it moves into the southwestern U.S., what will not uh, be diminishing is all of the rainfall associated with the hurricane as it moves northward. This is the hurricane model's uh, total accumulated precipitation forecast through the evening of Sunday, and you can see the swath of multiple inches of rain here moving up from the Baja Peninsula through California, Nevada, Arizona, and even beyond into deeper into the week, we'll see rain extending into the northern Rockies as well as the remnants track northward. And really most of the life-threatening impacts of Hillary will be water related. There's complex terrain here, mountain ranges, lots of ways to get landslides, flash flooding, mudslides, and even urban street flooding in flat metro areas like Los Angeles and San Diego. So we are going to see lots of water related hazards here. And that's gonna be the focus that you see from your National Weather Service office for good reason, as water related hazards are the most life-threatening uh, from any hurricane, but especially this one, as winds will be diminishing. However, I want to mention one thing uh, regarding the winds, and uh, that's this historical comparison to Hurricane Nora in 1997 
and Hurricane Kathleen in 1976. Both of these had similar tracks to Hillary, but they were a little bit to the east of the current NHC forecast. They went inland over the Baja Peninsula first. Hillary is expected to come up the coastline a little bit before going inland near Tijuana and San Diego. Uh, but these two storms here uh, were weakening as they came through, and they brought all the rain, flooding, etc. that we're expecting with Hillary. And the flooding was the most life-threatening impact from the storm, and we had some towns that went through extensive damage due to the water. The wind itself, not quite as life-threatening in most cases with a decaying storm like this, but for both of these storms, there were a lot of damage to crops in this whole area of the country. And so there was a lot of damage to products and a lot of problems with power outages and things of that nature. So not as life-threatening as the flooding, but certainly damaging and monetary costs were incurred. So that's something to watch out for with Hillary. This could have significant widespread impacts from the wind as well, even if it's not a hurricane uh, coming into this region. One more little detailed wrinkle about Hillary I want to touch on. This is the NOAA Hurricane Model surface wind forecast showing everything above purple in hurricane force, everything above green is tropical storm force. You can see the giant wind field here on Saturday evening. This is the coastline of the Baja Peninsula on the right here. Now, as the hurricane comes up, you'll see it weaken. As we talked about, it's over increasingly cold water, but there's still this little area of purple here for a while. So areas of the coastline of the Baja Peninsula do have hurricane watches and warnings up and could receive hurricane conditions. You'll note that the right front quadrant, the northeastern quadrant, is the strongest one. The hurricane will be accelerating toward the northwest, and so to the right of its motion, this is where all the strongest wind will be. That's also the side of the storm facing the coastline. So you could see this quadrant of strong wind kind of scrape the coast as it goes along. So that will be a wind hazard for coastal Baja Peninsula. Now, if Hillary does indeed stay offshore, this is the Mexico-California border here. If this sneaks up the coastline west of San Diego and Tijuana, this is how we could get a small area of California where wind impacts are particularly significant. If we have a little fist of wind just offshore that can impact the San Diego and or LA metro area with winds of you know 50, maybe 60 miles per hour, could cause power outages, downed trees, things of that nature. And that is something to keep in mind if the track is indeed just offshore at the very end. If it goes inland early, then we're spared from that particular wind impact and the coastal winds will be much weaker because this side of the storm has much less wind, you know, 30 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour at a maximum on most of these forecasts. So that will be something to watch is the decaying but still strong enough to cause problems fist of wind over a small area just east of Hillary's center as it moves up the coastline. So we'll keep an eye on that as we track the storm. This is the NHC official forecast as of this recording, and you can see what we talked about. Here's a large wind field that will be moving quickly to the northwest, accelerating as it moves up the coastline of the Baja Peninsula, where we have hurricane warnings and hurricane watches and tropical storm watches now extending into portions of Southern California. Some of this watch area has never seen a tropical storm watch before, so this is new to a lot of people in this area, and hurricanes are not a common thing for folks here, so it's important to be prepared and listen to what your local officials and National Weather Service office are saying about potential impacts and how to prepare for them. Again, the most life-threatening impacts are likely to be water-related. We're talking about flooding, flash flooding, mudslides, landslides, and mountainous areas especially, and also urban street flooding may occur in the metros of San Diego and Los Angeles and surrounding areas. So we're, we're talking mostly about water here, but as we mentioned, a tropical storm force winds, that's anything above 40 miles per hour, but below 75, that will be possible and could cause issues, especially if there's loose objects that can get blown around and power lines that can go down, take out power, trees that fall, those are all things that can be dangerous, uh, but water will be the most life-threatening hazard, so pay attention if you're in a, an area that could flood or has flooded in the past due to winter storms or what have you, and pay attention to what your local officials are saying about that. This is the graphic showing the flood potential. Flash flood risk is high over some of the deserts of Southern California right now, moderate over this whole red area, which encompasses LA and San Diego, all the way to the border with Arizona, and you can see that 
elevated risk of flash flooding will extend over most of the southwestern U.S. as the remnants of Hillary continue northward, dragging that moisture with it all the way up the Rockies. And again, noisy terrain and topography here. So although we're painting broad brush strokes about the impacts, localized impacts due to the mountains could cause some areas to receive significantly more rainfall more quickly than other places. So it's really about local details. And so it's important to realize that risk is just overall elevated here, and it could be very different depending on exactly where you are. So be careful and be prepared. That's about all I have for Hillary. Please keep in mind that I am painting mostly broad brush strokes here. I am not an expert on local impacts, certainly not for the southwestern U.S. The experts for that will be at your local National Weather Service forecast office, wherever you happen to be in this region, as well as the National Hurricane Center and your local emergency management personnel. Those folks will be able to tell you more about what will happen in particular locations. I'm just giving you the big picture here, and that's what I do in all of my videos. We're going to switch over now to the Atlantic Basin where we have several areas to watch. We're now entering the peak weeks of the Atlantic hurricane season. It's mid-August, typically around August 20th is when activity climatologically ramps up a lot. And we are seeing some areas here. One of them is a tropical wave currently in the Bahamas right here. You won't necessarily see it stand out to you, but there is a slight wind shift from southeast to northwest at the surface. And this trough axis is going to translate through the Florida Straits and into the Gulf of Mexico. There's currently an upper level low above the wave axis, but that's going to back away and weaken, allowing an area of upper level ridging and lower wind shear to develop over this wave. And it's also going to interact with this old cold front, which is draped here across Florida, which is going to enhance low level rotation and allow this wave to amplify a little bit in the Gulf of Mexico. Here's the European model showing low-level wind and vorticity in coloring. This is our tropical wave over the Bahamas right now. You'll see it track toward the northwest and amplify as it interacts with that old frontal boundary, so you can see it show up much better once it reaches the southeastern Gulf of Mexico on Sunday, and then it continues toward the west at a, a fairly quick clip. And by the time we get to early Monday morning, it's in the central Gulf, and if we peek at the winds aloft, we now see this upper-level ridge kind of over top of the system, which is kind of centered right here. This is a more favorable look to the environment than the wave is currently encountering today. And so conditions will improve and potentially allow further development of the wave as it cruises westward. And so on the model, you'll see the wave amplify, the color deepens to brighter orange. And by the time it arrives in South Texas, the Rio Grande Valley area, we have a potentially closed circulation that could be a tropical depression or storm on the model sometime on Tuesday morning or afternoon. Now, this has been a fairly consistent signal on the European model. It's been getting a little bit stronger with each run, and we're seeing on the GFS a similar forecast for an amplifying wave and maybe closing off of a circulation right before landfall near the Texas-Mexico border sometime on Tuesday afternoon or evening. So we're getting kind of a consistent signal here. Uh, one of the key aspects of this is that right now the wave doesn't have a lot of meat to it. You can tell from the satellite picture there's not a lot going on, so it will take time for there to be anything going on. And this wave will have maybe two and a half days to cross the Gulf of Mexico, and during that time uh, it'll be organizing, but it will take it, it will take that duration uh, to develop. So it's not going to rapidly develop into anything crazy like a hurricane, most likely, based on what we're seeing right now. In addition, we have this big suppressive ridge over the southern U.S., that's generating subsidence, dry air along the Gulf Coast, and also a little bit of wind shear because the low-level easterlies here are quite strong. So conditions won't be ideal, uh, but they will be favorable enough to potentially allow some last-minute development before this reaches the coastline, most likely somewhere near southern Texas. And if we're lucky, this will simply bring rainfall to a region that really needs it. Uh, most of this area is in drought, so hopefully this is more of a beneficial system than anything. So if it doesn't develop too much, this will hopefully be good news. Uh, but we'll be able to give you more details once we see this out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Right now, there, there's not a lot to track as there's nothing organized associated with this tropical wave. So we need to wait a couple of days before we'll know more about the details of any potential impacts to northern Mexico or the northwestern Gulf Coast of the United States.
Okay, moving on to some other systems. We're going to switch to the Central Atlantic Satellite View. So to orient you here, this is the Caribbean. Here's the Lesser Antilles. This is Puerto Rico. This is the Dominican Republic. We're looking out at the monsoon trough in the Central Atlantic. This is about the time of year when this starts to get really active. We're seeing general southerlies and southwesterlies over this part of the basin, trade winds on the north side. So this whole area here is a giant trough and there are multiple vortices forming along it. We see a well-developed one that's rather broad but vigorous on the eastern side. That is likely to become a tropical depression at any time. We also see a tighter looking vortex in the middle. This one could argue is already a tropical depression, but the National Hurricane Center is probably waiting to see if convection becomes more organized. You can see the circulation is currently exposed and there's no thunderstorm activity on the north side, mostly because this is all very, very dry and arid air up here where the circulation is currently located. But we also have an area of rotation broadly on the western end of the monsoon trough. This is taking the form of more of a trough axis right now, southwesterlies, curling into the trade winds out of the northeast so it's more like a wave pocket at the moment but this one is close to the lesser antilles and will likely be moving through the windward islands over the next couple of days bringing showers and rainfall and the potential for flash flooding and could develop a little bit as it enters the eastern caribbean let's take a look at the european model and uh, I'm going to spoil the ending there, uh, but here's the, the current setup. Again, you've got one, two, three areas, and it's been difficult for models to forecast these well, uh, because typically when you have multiple vortices close together, uh, that presents a lot of nonlinearity to the forecast and makes it difficult to predict uh, accurately and can be very sensitive to small changes in what happens in reality. We can see that the middle one is currently the strongest. However, it may not last very long because it's right up there in the dry air. On the European, what actually happens is uh, we get uh, this one to start developing further in the Eastern Caribbean while this one weakens off to the Northeast. And one of the reasons for that is if we look aloft at the upper level flow, uh, this one is kind of underneath an upper level ridge over the Eastern Caribbean as it crosses the Windward Islands. And trade winds are not crazy strong, which they often are in the Caribbean, especially during an El Nino year like this year. Uh, but if you check out this overall flow pattern, there's quite a fetch of southeasterly flow coming out of South America and the deep tropics northward into the Eastern Caribbean. That implies that the overall trade winds are being reduced and there's a supply of moisture into this area. And so if wind shear is light enough, it could allow some organization of this system. But if we look at the upper levels one more time, uh, we see that there's a big upper level tut, uh, upper level trough, uh, draped across the central Atlantic. So there's a belt of westerlies. So both of our eastern systems and the middle system will be running into higher levels of wind shear right away, which is why on the model, you see that these two systems do exist, but they, they remain fairly weak. The only one that continues to develop is this one because it's under the least wind shear. And it's fairly similar on the GFS. If we look at its forecast, it shows this one developing more. Uh, the middle one actually came from, from over here and kind of gets absorbed into this one uh, in the northeastern Caribbean. And this one remains broad and fairly weak. This is a complex situation. There are details to figure out here. Uh, even if we do get development of a 99L, this invest in the eastern Caribbean over the next few days, it will run into some complicated conditions after that point, we'll have more troughing digging in over the southwestern Atlantic, and this could get dragged north of the Caribbean, perhaps near Hispaniola, perhaps near Puerto Rico. Details to be determined, that would be about four or five days from now. So we'll be watching for a rainfall event potentially here. But then after that, details are very murky because the interaction with this shear belt and this upper level tut is going to be difficult to pin down right now. But as we go through the next few days, we'll start to get more details on this. This one is probably most likely to cause impacts to land. Uh, the other one in the middle here, this is likely to stay pretty weak. We'll likely see enhanced showers over the entire Eastern Caribbean, so potential for flash flooding across this whole region, uh, but I would expect the Western one to be the most likely to cause issues down the line. This Eastern one will likely be a tropical depression or a storm for a few days, but it is unlikely to impact land areas over the next few days. So we'll keep a close eye on all of these the National Hurricane Center has significant chances of development for all four of these systems so we could see multiple storms 
uh, as we go into this weekend and early next week. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.